Good afternoon, uh, dear friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the next uh, webinar organized by the Eurasian Research Institute. Uh, my name is uh, Dorian Aden. I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, military depot explosions in Kazakhstan uh, and about some lessons uh, that uh, we gained as a result of those explosions. Uh, first of all, let me remind you about the uh, tragic incident that we all witnessed last year in June uh, 2019, an ammunition depot exploded in the town of Aris, which is located in the Turkestan region of Kazakhstan. And unfortunately, it was not the first explosion which uh, took place in that town. There were three deaths and tens of people were injured. Um, authorities declared the state of emergency and had to organize a mass evacuation of more than 44 residents of Arus. Uh, the explosion damaged private property and public infrastructure. Um, the population was displaced. And as a result, we saw some social unrest because people were naturally um, unsatisfied with the situation that uh, took place after the explosion and um, we also should take into account that Aris was a, is a major railway hub and the explosion interrupted transport communication for some time. Uh, as uh, revealed recently, um, the explosion destroyed uh, ammunition worth uh, 96 billion tenge and um, the total damage of the population and legal entities is estimated at more than 100, 143 billion tenge. And the government uh, spent uh, nearly 38 billion tenge on emergency response measures. Currently, the trial on the explosion is ongoing in Shimkent, uh, the former uh, center, administrative center of the region. And um, 16 military personnel, both uh, high ranking and low ranking, uh, are under trial for accused uh, in, in, in the uh, circumstances that led uh, to the explosion. Uh, why I decided to talk about this topic today? Uh, in 2010-2011, I participated in the study conducted on military depot explosions, among other things, uh, that took place in Kazakhstan uh, in 2001, 2009. Uh, unfortunately, as we see from the incidents that took place uh, in 2014, 2015, and the 2019 explosion, and all of them happened in Aris, uh, no lessons or not all lessons were learned properly. So uh, let me first of all uh, pay your attention to the definition of uh, ammunition depot explosions. Uh, in research terms, uh, it is called unplanned explosion at munition sites, and um, as such, uh, they include accidents resulting in explosions of abandoned, damaged, or inappropriately stored or properly store, stored stock, stockpiles of munitions and explosives. And please also bear in mind that munition sites comprise both uh, storage areas and processing sites, whether temporary or permanent. And this is important in, in the context of the risk explosions, uh, because uh, the explosions there took place both at the storage sites, uh, at the military depots, and at the processing sites, where uh, the, there were activities related to the disposal of uh, munitions. Uh, when we talk about the typology of impacts, uh, we should uh, take into account that there are direct uh, impacts and indirect impacts. Uh, so direct impact includes, uh, first of all, human costs, deaths, injuries, uh, material damage, as I mentioned, um, the explosion, explosions destroy public property, private property, interrupts uh, transport communication. And there is also environmental impact because um, 
an explosion is a chemical process and when thousands of tons of explode of uh, ammunition explode of course there is a uh, large scale release of harmful dangerous substances which uh, contaminate the environment and uh, also there is uh, there are indirect uh, consequences uh, such as socioeconomic costs as as i already mentioned billions of tenge were spent on emergency response uh, on compensations to people to public entities for the damages related to the explosion and there is also an institutional impact because um, as a result of the explosion as a result of the investigations uh, some officials are dismissed some officials are put on trial there could be also some reorganization of the government agencies which are responsible uh, for this area there could be some legislative changes and so of course as we see there is a variety of impacts uh, during our study uh, conducted in 2010-2011, we focused on three case, uh, cases. Uh, first of all, it was the explosion at the Tokrau 10 ammunition depot, which uh, took place in, 2000, uh, in August 2001. Um, the second one was the explosion, which I mentioned, in the town of Arras, uh, which took place in March 2009. And the third explosion was at the explosion at the ammunition depot of the Committee for National Security's Border Guard Service, uh, which was which is located not far from Almaty. Um, uh, the project was carried out by Small Arms Survey, which is a research uh, group uh, based in Geneva, and. Uh, it focuses on research related to small arms and light weapons, including ammunition depot explosions. And the team of small arms survey composed of uh, Nikola, Flokan, uh, me, and Tatmina Karimova. We conducted focus groups with log logistical support from the Center of Public Opinion Research in August, September 2010. Uh, we focused on impacts of ammunition depot explosions in neighboring communities during the focus groups. I personally was the moderator of all the focus groups. Uh, I conducted them in Russian and in Kazakh, mostly in Kazakh. Uh, there were uh, six focus group discussions in total in three affected communities, in Ortadirisen, in Aros, and in Karavoy. There were eight participants per group. And we decided to separate men and women so that they did not influence the opinions of each other to get perspectives of male perspective separately from the female's perspective. We also used other sources uh, in our research. First of all, of course, um, interviews with uh, responsible people, with officials, with key informants, people that have um, close access to information about the uh, issue. We made uh, several official information requests to the government and we got responses to some of them. Uh, we also reviewed publicly available government documents, including uh, Kazakhstan's uh, reports to the international bodies, such as the United Nations. And uh, we also reviewed related studies, for example, in the case of the Tokrau 10 explosion, there was a study um, um, written by the nuclear scientists, scientists who took part in the uh, emergency response activities at the site, because um, during the focus groups, uh, the local residents claimed that there was some radiation released as a result of the explosion. Um, and, um, that study confirmed that, uh, in fact, there, there was some ammunition, uh, some depleted uranium-based ammunition uh, at that site. We also did some press review uh, because of the sensitivity of the topic, not uh, all materials are available in government documents. And in, uh, for some aspects, uh, press articles and reports were helpful. Um, because they were written by knowledgeable people uh, and they shed light on some unknown aspects. 
So let me talk about our key findings. Uh, first of all, we learned that Kazakhstan inherited enormous ammunition stockpiles from the Soviet Union. Uh, most of them were ammunition um, which was uh, taken out of Afghanistan uh, and Armenian. Uh, but uh, at the same time, Kazakhstan uh, organized some domestic production and the 2007 military doctrine has given new momentum to the production, not only of small weapons, small arms and weapons, but also some ammunition. Uh, one of the positive developments was that the government uh, seriously uh, undertook some serious measures to get rid of surplus conventional ammunition and uh, in the period of 2003-2011 some 1.1 million units of uh, ammunition of surplus ammunition were destroyed. Uh, Moreover, the government introduced new regulations on demilitarization activities, which uh, promoted, which um, gave some um, momentum to the disposal activities. At the same time, um, um, at least six large scale and plant explosions at ammunition depots were recorded in Kazakhstan in that period. Um, we also noticed that there was a lack of transparency on state stockpiles, which is quite understandable given the sensitivity of the topic. Uh, uh, at the same time, we learned that Kazakhstan undertook the destruction of excess stockpiles unilaterally, although there were some opportunities for international collaboration. For example, there was a proposal from NATO uh, about collaboration in this field, but Kazakhstan, the government decided to uh, to move uh, on its own, which is also understandable. Uh, and one of the aspects of uh, ammunition destruction efforts was that uh, in Kazakhstan, private entities were subcontracted to dispose of and reprocess out of date ammunition for civilian use, which is uh, quite normal, but at the same time, uh, there was some lack of control over their activities, which led to, in the case of the Aris explosion in 2009, uh, to the uh, explosion because of the disregard of technical safety rules. Uh, during our focus groups, we learned that uh, the local population was mainly aware of the existence of the ammunition depots before the incidents because, uh, well, it was, they were located close to the settlements and some people were even employed there as contract workers. Uh, but on the other hand, local residents were not aware of the causes of the incidents. Of course, some of them heard something, heard rumors. Some of them watched TV reports or read uh, newspaper articles, but most of them were not aware of the causes. And the authorities did not explain um, in the, uh, after the explosions, what caused them uh, in all three cases that we studied. And uh, as a result, some respondents believed that the explosions were a cover up for theft and illegal sales of weapons and ammunition. And uh, of course, they had some ground to believe so because uh, we know about uh, criminal cases when the military personnel was involved in, in the theft of. Uh, and sales of uh, weapons and ammunition. And uh, they had some legitimate reasons uh, to believe that this was the cause of, explosion, of the explosions. Uh, during our focus groups, uh, respondents uh, told us that they did not receive any government assistance or if they received, they received some insignificant sums, uh, insignificant amounts for their lost property. But it should be noted uh, that um, all the explosions, um, all three explosions, they did not cause as much damage as was caused by the latest one in 2019 in Aras. Uh, focus group participants also claimed that funds allocated for assistance were embezzled by local officials. So 
uh, I would say that some respondents believed that the government allocated funds, but because of the uh, dishonest uh, local officials, they did not get uh, the assistance that they were entitled to. Uh, during the focus groups, uh, respondents uh, pointed out to the fact that the authorities did not organize any emergency response training for the civilian population living near the ammunition depots. Um, and uh, at the same time, while fearing the closed location of ammunition depots, the majority of participants indicated that they provided much needed jobs. So it was some sort of a um, trade-off between security and employment, so to speak. So let me focus on the 2009 RS explosion because uh, we will find some striking similarities with what happened in 2019, 10 years after. Uh, as uh, we were told by the local residents, uh, there was some damaged property after, uh, as a result of the explosion. There were broken windows, knocked out doors, cracked roofs and walls. Uh, so while the explosion was not as large scale as it was last year, there was still a dramatic community reaction. There was a mass fear, shock and panic. And according to respondents, the situation resembled a disorganized wartime evacuation. Um, according to eyewitnesses, the authorities did not arrange for any transportation to evacuate the civilian population. And they also claimed that taxi drivers and petrol station owners took advantage of the situation and inflated prices. And um, unfortunately, we saw the similar picture uh, in Aarhus uh, last year, uh, which was even more dramatic because of the scale of the explosion, because this time there was an explosion at the uh, military storage site, not at the reprocessing facility. Uh, so um, while the government did its best to organize the evacuation properly, still th there were some aspects which resembled um, the 2009 incident. And there were press reports about taxi drivers, uh, inflating prices, and so on. So uh, um, we, after we completed the study and uh, after we wrote our uh, report, our final report, uh, we organized some meetings with government officials, uh, with uh, interested stakeholders and provided a list of recommendations. Uh, first of all, we uh, focused on, on the fact that um, the government should address problems in the management of ammunition stockpiles, including disposal, because as I said, um, at the time uh, of the 2009 RS explosion, uh, the, the private entity Kazars now was involved uh, in the disposal of the ammunition, and there was some. Uh, this private entity did not always follow technical safety rules, and as as a result, there was an explosion, which led to deaths, injuries, uh, and to some material damage. So our first recommendation was that the government should. Um, address the problem in this field. And of course, um, as part of this, uh, major focus should be on ensuring safety and security of stockpiles, including stores of surplus uh, ammunition. Uh, and um, if uh, the government um, takes adequate measures, uh, this will not only help prevent further accidents, further explosions, but would also but will also decrease the risk of arms being diverted to unauthorized entities and individuals. So proper management meant um, introducing, in addition to adequate safety and security uh, norms, also adequate uh, control and accounting systems, so that um, no 
uh, official, no entity could uh, embezzle funds, could divert uh, ammunition or weapons. So, uh, and this, is, uh, this has a, an enormous importance because ammunition and arms they represent high risk. And uh, in the time of, uh, 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 of high terrorism risks, uh, it is very important to uh, maintain safety and security of military arsenals. Uh, another recommendation was that <clears throat> military facilities such as ammunition depots and <clears throat> military training ranges should be located far from human settlements. The problem is that <clears throat> in many cases, <clears throat> ammunition depots are located near military training ranges, and this is the case in all uh, in all the cases we studied. And uh, of course, it is very convenient for the military because um, they don't have to carry ammunition to a long distance uh, in order to organize some trainings, but this represents uh, a higher risk for, for the settlements lo located nearby. And um, we, uh, there were many incidents when local residents died because of uh, uh, not only unexploded ordnance, but also uh, being uh, caught in the middle of some training, uh, or not only uh, deaths, but also some injuries. Um, and uh, another important aspect uh, that we uh, recommended to address was um, the aspect of emer emergency response trainings for the population, because <clears throat> communities living near ammunition depots uh, must know how to behave in emergency situations in order not to panic. And um, uh, as we saw in all the instances, um, the evacuation was not properly organized. There was mass fear and um, such training, such emergency training would uh, make the process in case of emergencies uh, more organized and it, it is also important to cre cre create designated collection points or evacuation centers we, and <clears throat> uh, that was one of the recommendations we made. And also um, in terms of Kazakhstan's international commitments, uh, international standing, we recommended that uh, increased transparency and cooperation would help Kazakhstan benefit from international expertise uh, and best practices in this area. Because obviously, while Kazakhstan can do uh, disposal efforts on its own, um, as we see from the unfortunate incidents that happened, um, gaining from international experience would will help and. Um, will help organize the process properly, will help avoid unnecessary uh, unwanted explosions and unnecessary damage and loss of human life uh, and material property. Uh, as I said on uh, several occasions, we communicated our findings and recommendations to the government representatives, to other interested stakeholders. Uh, unfortunately, this does not, did not help to prevent the 2019 explosion. Uh, but uh, as we see um, from the measures taken by the government of Kazakhstan lately, we see that <coughs> uh, the relevant uh, agencies, they started to take the problem seriously and we see uh, changes in the legislation, we see changes in the institutional structure, we see that um, some responsible persons that did not implement their duties properly were put on trial uh, and this um, gives us hope that um, there will be no any further explosions in Kazakhstan. Uh, 
but certainly it's better to learn uh, on others' mistakes than on our own. Uh, but as we see uh, in this case, we have to learn both on our own uh, mistakes and experience as well as on international experience. So um, I thank you for your attention. I hope uh, this webinar was useful and uh, interesting. Um,